Hello friends. Welcome to You Step In Hope Ministries. My name is Hans Peters and I pastor here. It's a blessing to have you join us today. You know, today is a special day. In North America, we celebrate Mother's Day today. So I pray for all those who are mothers, for all those who are in the motherly role. May the Lord bless you this day. May today be a day full of love, good memories and hugs. Yes. Amen. In today's message, I'll be sharing from 1 Peter chapter 3. And today's title is, A Picture of Doing Good. Today's message marks the sixth in the series, Lord of All. Let's begin in prayer. Almighty God, you have set before us a path to follow. But we so often wander off on our own trying to find our own way. Sometimes, like toddlers, we hear your call and we come back. Other times, we're like little children, testing our boundaries, ignoring your call until fear finally makes us look back. And still other times, we are full of youthful rebellion, demanding to be cut loose and set free, not knowing how much we still need to seek your wisdom and guidance. But most of all, too often, we think we're adults. And we have it all figured out and know our own way. Only to stumble or stray too far. Lord, help us to seek you every day to acknowledge that we need your wisdom and guidance. Lord, help us Guide us. Let us return to the path you have laid out for us. Let us walk with you. For it is in the name of Christ, who is our companion on this journey of faith, that we pray. Amen. You know, as I was taking a walk one day this week, I suddenly noticed how quiet it had become. But it wasn't a peaceful silence. You couldn't hear any birds. There were no bunnies jumping or robins looking for food in the field. And my dog seemed to smell something strange and different and, and didn't want to continue walking. I didn't have an explanation. But a couple of days later in the early afternoon, I saw two foxes walking in front of the community garden and in, our, in front of our houses. <laughs> and there was the answer. It seems that the birds and animals all smell danger. And then they hid. It's like they were telling each other, Hey, watch out! There's a new fox family in the neighborhood. They don't hate us, but they will eat us. All this reminds me about when Peter advises us in chapter 3 that too often we see peace as merely the absence of conflicts. But it could easily mean more. In verses, first half of verse 8, second half of verse 11, and first half of verse 12, it says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, search for peace, and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. At the beginning of chapter 3, Peter's advice was to wives, to live godly lives and submit with gentleness. In today's passage, Peter's advice is for all people. Peter says we should do good even if this causes suffering. He advises us also on how we ought to be dealing with with difficult people. In Peter's time, the time of this letter, and, and this was in the second half of the first century, right from the time of the first Easter, with the announcement of our Lord's resurrection and the accompanying promise of new life in Him, in Jesus, everyone thought that Jesus' return will happen soon. But, for these new Christians, as the years go by, 
there was the delay in Jesus' return. So hope began to fade. It became blurry. And really, this wasn't the only problem they faced. In his letter, Peter makes it clear, not only to the Jewish community, but to all, Jews and Gentiles alike, that they need to seek God. They need to remain faithful. They need to live lives that befit a good conscience. After all, with the antagonism and outright persecution of those among whom they lived, there was the very real experience of daily suffering that was almost more than they could bear. Well, today, for you, my friends, no matter what present experience may imply to the contrary, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. In today's text, the writer opens by encouraging his readers to work against all the signs of intimidation in their lives by keeping the knowledge of Christ as their Lord at the center of their hearts. Okay, with this in mind, if you have your Bible with you, whether it's paper or app, and if you're able, please open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. Today I will be reading from verse 13 to verse 22, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. Here's what it says. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid for the, of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Even if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. <laughs> Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who obeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Word of the Lord. We are familiar with Paul's triad of faith, hope, and love, and his remark that the greatest of these is love. Uh, you can find that in 1 Corinthians 13. Now for Peter's audience, the more important of these gifts is hope. In this case, hope is at risk. For these who have difficulty keeping hope alive in the midst of their persecution and troubled lives. So it is both instructive and effective that the letter opens with a beautiful assertion of the blessing of God's mercy accomplished in the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is now bestowed on those believers through their new birth into a living hope. Not only is this a present and living hope, but is, it is kept in safety, 
on deposit, as it were, in heaven. And so under God's faithful protection as an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Remember 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5? It says there, Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfailing the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. When people suffer sickness, when an enemy attacks you verbally or physically, when we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, we so often ask this one question. Where is God? And that question gives rise to a second question. How may we know God is real? To answer these questions, remember this. God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, as living evidence. God also chose Peter and others to show what a difference true faith makes in the real world. So listen to what the Lord says. Be at peace and trust in our Lord. It seems the ones who persecute, attack, and destroy homes or people were living lives that embody the opposite of what love means. Hate seems to be their operative word. About this one word, hate, let's take a look at what the scriptures teach us about this word. Because, biblically speaking, there are positive and negative aspects to hatred. For example, it is acceptable to hate those things that God hates. And they, indeed, this is a, very much a proof of a right standing with God. Psalm 97, the first half of verse 10, in the New King James Version says, You who love the Lord hate evil. Folks, the closer our walk with the Lord, and the more we fellowship with Him, the more conscious we will be of sin, both within and without. Do we not grieve and burn with anger when God's name is maligned? When we see spiritual hypocrisy? When we see blatant unbelief and godless behavior? The more we understand God's attributes and love His character, the more we will be like Him, and the more we will hate those things that are contrary to His word and nature. However, this word, hate or hatred, has to be negative when it's directed against others. The Lord Jesus mentions hatred in the Sermon of the Mount. Listen to Matthew 5.22 in the New King James Version. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell hellfire. Folks, Raka is an Arabic word meaning useless, fool. It can even be rendered as cursed or empty-headed. When used in anger, it really signifies hatred. Remember, folks, the Lord commands that not only should we be reconciled with our brother or sister before we come before him, before God, but that we do it quickly. In Matthew 25, or sorry, in Matthew 5:23, Jesus says, "Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. The act of murder itself was certainly condemned. But hatred is a heart sin, and any hateful thought or act is an act of murder in God's eyes for which justice will be demanded, possibly not in this life, 
but justice will be demanded on the day of judgment. So heinous is the position of hate before God that a man who hates is said to be walking in darkness as opposed to the light. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9-11, to 11, He's, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The worst situation is that of a man or woman who continues professing religion but remains at enmity with his or her brother or sister. The scriptures declare that such a person is a liar. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God? whom he has not seen. Folks, he or she may fool men, but they cannot fool God. Think about it. How many believers live for, for years, most of their lives, pretending that all is well, putting on a front, only to be found finally wanting because they have harbored enmity, hatred, against a fellow believer. Hatred is a poison that destroys us from within, producing bitterness that eats away at our hearts and minds. So, what can we do to not fall into this trap? Friends, this is why the scriptures tell us not to let a root of bitterness spring up in our hearts, as it says in Hebrews 12.15. It says there, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. There's no doubt about it. When a heart begins to seed envy and hate, we need to work hard to get rid of that. Folks, hatred destroys the personal witness of a Christian because it removes him or her from fellowship with the Lord and other believers. So, let us be careful to do as the Lord told us and keep short accounts with everyone about everything, no matter how small. And the Lord will be faithful to forgive as he promised in 1 John 1, verse 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Okay, and here's something we might apply to our own lives. After all, what a difference God makes. Because you too are God's witness to skeptical people. Let your life be evidence of God's truth. Remember verse 15 of our text today? It says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Folks, keep your conduct above criticism. Some Christians believe that faith is a personal matter that should be kept to oneself. And it's true, we shouldn't be rowdy or noisy or obnoxious in sharing our faith. But we should always be ready to give an answer, gently and respectfully when asked about our faith, about our lifestyle, about our Christian perspective. Okay, now I must ask, and, and I ask you to think about it. Can others see your hope in Christ? Well, can they? Are you prepared to tell them what Christ has done in your life? And I think that even if your life is smooth and easy, or maybe you're young and think there isn't much to tell, still be positive and be ready to tell your story. 
On the other hand, if you have conflict with others and you try to hide from them, find Christian brothers or sisters to support you when you are badly hurt. Maybe it's time to go out to forgive and share your experience. This will help the process of healing and it might just work to build a bridge of restoration between yourself and those who hurt you. The first half of verse 16 of our text today says, But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Folks, you may not be able to keep people from speaking evil against you, but you can at least stop supplying them with ammunition. Keep your conduct above criticism. As long as you do what is right, their accusations will be empty and only embarrass them. <laughs> Look at what happened in Genesis chapter 6. It's the story of Noah. Verses 11 to 13 say, Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. And then God tells Noah what to do while building the boat. Noah, preach. <laughs> what does your picture of yourself doing good look like? In Genesis 6.22, in the, the Bible version, The Voice, we have Noah's response. So Noah listened to God, and he built the ark. He did everything God asked him to do. Now, Peter provides several past examples of God's judgment, with one of them being the flood described in the book of Genesis chapter 6. In referencing the flood, Peter names Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And just a quick note, the Greek word for preacher can be translated as herald, as someone making an official public proclamation. It probably took Noah and his family around 120 years to build the ark. And all that time naturally afforded Noah the opportunity to, to share with those around him the reason for the ark's construction. Apocryphal books and historians like Josephus mention Noah's preaching, for example, saying this, Single among all men, most just and true, was the most faithful Noah. And to him God himself from heaven thus spoke, Noah, be of good cheer in thyself, and to all the people preach repentance, so that they may all be saved. But if, with shameless soul, they heed me not, the whole race I will utterly destroy. Friends, scholars add about Jesus that the traditional interpretation is that between the time of his death and his resurrection, Christ announced salvation to God's faithful followers who had been waiting for their salvation during the whole Old Testament era. But others think that Christ's spirit was in Noah as Noah preached to those imprisoned by sin. In any case, this passage shows a picture of God himself doing good to us through Jesus Christ his Son. Jesus Christ's good news of salvation and victory is not limited. We may take with us these three truths out of verses 18 to 20. This is of our text today. And they are, God speaks, God triumphs, God saves. The first one, God speaks. While we puzzle over what, where, and how, we can see that God is communicating with the world. The second, God triumphs. Christ victoriously preached, indicating his power, control, and transcendence over all creation. And third, God saves. God exerts himself to rescue those who desire him, who love him. This passage tells us at least this much. And that is much indeed. 
Ending with verse 21, where Peter says that Noah's salvation from the flood symbolized baptism, a ceremony involving water. In baptism, we identify with Jesus Christ, who separates from us from the lost and gives us new life. Therefore, you must worship Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your word. And Lord, help us to remember your love for us. After all, you are our Lord, the Lord of all. Peter says in verse 21, And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers except his authority. As do we when we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, allow me to speak a benediction. May Christ, our crucified Savior, draw you to himself so that you may find in him the assurance of sins forgiven and the gift of eternal life. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and always as we go to love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, be blessed until we meet again.